Um, two more topics to talk about, tables and then an introduction to JavaScript. Um, we have, after today, we have four more classes. So that should give us enough time to get through these, because I would think tables would take up most of today, or take up today, and maybe a little bit on Monday, and then we'll get into JavaScript. Of primary importance, though, is your project. So make sure that if you have questions concerning your project, you get those addressed. Tables. Tables allow you to create um, a structure where you have rows and columns. Like if you think of a table of data. In other words, something that you'd see in an Excel worksheet. So, if you had something like this, names of cities, All right, forming the rows of the table. Then the columns might be the average temperature for January, February, March, and so on. Where you have a grid of rows and columns. So you can identify what a particular cell is by looking up and looking across. So for example, this cell here is the March temperature for Boston. Okay? So that kind of structure is, is also known as a table. All right? And again, it's, it's like something that you'd have in an Excel worksheet. Now, just as a brief sideline here, back in the bad old days, People would use tables to achieve a layout in HTML. That's a cart, I think. I thought that was thunder. Before CSS was supported well by browsers, developers still wanted to achieve a look on their page and a certain layout. And they oftentimes would do that via a table. Um, that's one of the reasons why we talk about tables so late in the class. We want to make sure that you get uh, a good understanding of CSS um, and understand that you do not need tables to achieve layouts. So if any of you have done web development before and you use tables, don't use tables anymore. Only use CSS to get the layout of a page. Use tables for the purpose for which they were originally intended. That is, a table of data. And if you think about it, there's no other way to achieve this sort of thing um, with the HTML that we know so far. We could try putting spaces and putting things on different lines, but remember how HTML treats white space. It, it ignores extra white space. So if we put extra spaces to space out the columns, and if we put uh, a new line between Cleveland and Boston, that wouldn't do anything in the browser. So we do need a table. So let's go and let's create a simple table that does this very thing. And we'll talk about the basics of tables today. And then um, we'll talk about accessibility issues and, and uh, other more advanced things, either today or next time.
Now, usually this table like this might appear in an article, let's say. So I'm going to, even though it's not absolutely necessary to do this to illustrate tables, I'm going to put it inside an article just as a reminder. All right, I know sometimes my examples are a little bit bare bone just because there's specific things I want to illustrate. And we can put an H1 here saying, well, let's do a header. Weather across the U.S. And maybe we have something like this. All right. First kind of tag we have is a table tag. And a table tag goes around the entire table. So you're going to have one table tag per table. You can think of it sort of like the list tag. A list tag, whether it be a UL or an OL, contains list items. And typically, you know, um, a list tag or a table tag goes around several items. Now, in the case of a table, the items are called table rows. So, that is done with a TR tag. So, in this example here, we have actually four rows. One, two, three, four. All right? So, we're going to have four TR tags, and they're all going to be within the table tag. Now, each row has one, two, three, four, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 table cells in it. All right? One for each month going all the way across. Table cells are done either with THs or TDs. THs represent table headings. So, for example, these will be THs. These will be TDs because they're table data. Now again, that's a conceptual way to look at it. Um, by default, the browser is going to make TDs and THs look a certain way. Well, if we don't like the way that that looks, we can always change it via CSS. But that doesn't mean we lie and call this a TD simply because we want it to look like a TD looks. We keep it as a TH and then change our style. So. So I'm going to put my column headers here, the first column being city. Then we have January. February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December.
All right, so that's our table headers. All right, we're then going to have a row for each city. So in our case, we had three cities. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to make one row and clone it. And I'll just put in a value of 32 for the temperature, because that sounds about right. Then I'll clone this for the other two cities. Boston and Los Angeles. All right, let's go and save this. Put on the desktop. And if we view it, we get a nice list of rows and columns. Now, remember a few things about this. All right? Let's make some observations about this. How big are each column? In other words, each TD sort of lines up as a column. How big is each column? They're as big as it needs to be to fit the largest thing in it. So for example, May, only being three letters, is a lot smaller than January, which is more than three letters. And August is somewhere between those two, and so on and so forth. All right, so by default, again, remember, as with anything, the way that something looks depends on a combination of the browser's default behavior and the CSS that you put in. All right. So in this case, things line up in columns based on their position in the TD. In other words, the first TD of every row lines up, the second TD of every row lines up, and so on down the line. Okay. Notice that THs are centered and bold. Now, it's easy to convince you that the word city is centered, right? Because you can see city is centered over that column. It might be a little harder to convince you that the title of the month is centered, and that is simply because the title of the month is the biggest thing. So it's centered within an area that's as big as it is. All right. If I were to go and give a really outrageous temperature, something like that for January, then you can see that January is in fact centered over that column. The only reason it might not be clear is because this is centered, but that's as big as the column is, so it takes up all the space. Wow, that was easy. All right. Again, as they say, the devil is in the details. All right, because we want to control the way it looks, and we also um, want to do something as far as accessibility goes. So, what are the accessibility issues with tables? Well, 
the accessibility issues with tables are this. If I were to tell you, if, if the screen reader was reading this number, 32, how do you know what that number means? You visually go up and visually go across. So your eye looks up and says, well, that's for the month of November, and it goes across and says that is for Boston. Well, that's well and good if you can see it. If, you, if however, you cannot see it then, then you have a problem. All right? And that's, uh, that's what we mean to address um, with our accessibility things. The other thing is, is we can make this look a little neater if we um, did something as far as um, the layout goes. Maybe make the columns a uniform size or, or something like that. All right? So we're going to concentrate on styling this and we're going to concentrate on accessibility. Then we're going to look at a couple things that we can use to augment a table. First one I want to put in right off the bat. And that is a caption. Because I have this up here, but that's not part of the table. All right? Actually, it would be better if this was part of the table. Well, you can't stick an H1 smack dab in the middle of the table. But you can put on the table what's called a caption. And that will appear... Now it's centered, and it's over the table. And more importantly, it's part of the table itself, which is going to help screen readers out in picking that. In other words, the screen reader, because this is actually part of that tag, it can read the caption to you without having to depend on the logic that, well, that H1 must belong to this uh, table because the H1 is immediately prior to the table. All right. Let's go in and let's put some sizes on some of these things. All right? I'm going to start, first of all, by making, and I'm going to, again, embed the style sheet right in the HTML. Not that you should do this, but just for demonstration purposes. I'm going to put a width on the table of... 85%. All right. And so it made the table this big. Notice what happens when I resize the table. It gets bigger. It gets smaller to a certain point. It will not break up or cut off any of the data. So when you put the width on a table, the browser won't let it cut off information in a table cell. So that width will be done as well as the browser can do it. That's one thing that we'll find about tables is that it's possible for you to give impossible conditions in the CSS. And if you do that, the browser takes its best shot, all right, and tries its best to display it. All right. Next 
thing I want to do is I want to make each column in the table a uniform size. Now, if you style one cell, it styles all the cells. If you give, let me, let me rephrase that. If you give a width to a single cell in the table, that styles the whole column. So if I say THs, I want to have a width of 100%. pixels, for example. If I give a width of 100 pixels for, for all them, notice it can't do that. Let's try making it 50 pixels. All right. There it made each of them the same size. Except, November looks a little bit bigger. Well, why is November bigger? Well, because again, it's not going to cut off. Alright? So we can, can, we can give conflicting instructions, and we can give instructions that the page can't necessarily implement. And if we do that, the browser takes its best shot and makes adjustments. Let me make this a smaller table. Let me only go through the first quarter of the year. That way we have more flexibility sizing it. So I'm going to get rid of some of these table cells. All right. Now, if I go in and say I want the table to have a width, of 50% of the screen. And I want each TH to have a width of 100 pixels. At a certain point, it can't do that, right? Because 50% of the screen is now less than 400. So it makes adjustments. How does it make adjustments? Based on the size. So January and February are slightly bigger than March. If it can do it, it will do it. All right. Now if I do something like... 25%. Those should be even. But again, at a certain point, it will no longer be able to make them even. And in fact, it will no longer make, be able to make it a width of 50% of the page because there's simply too much data in there. In which case, the browser, not wanting to cut anything off, we'll make it bigger than 50% and we'll get rid of the uneven, I'm sorry, we'll get rid of the even columns making them uneven. I guess I just point this out as a reminder that if you give the browser instructions that it can't follow, it will do its best and it will make adjustments. All right? So in this case, it can't follow these. It can't make the, the, the table 50% without cutting stuff off. So it ignores your style rule of 50%. Likewise, it ignores your style rule of 25% in order to fit everything in. All right. Now, we can do all sorts of other things as far as styling goes to make this look better. 
For example, we could style the caption. And we can style it any number of ways. We can make it left aligned. We can make the font size bigger. We can give it a different font family. So now it does it that way. Left aligns it, uses the other font, and so on. Right now I have the columns even. What if I wanted to make the city column bigger? There could be some long city names potentially. How could I make just that one column bigger? Okay, you give it an ID. Again, the one thing that um, I, I think I mentioned throughout class, but I may not emphasize it enough, is the ability to give IDs and classes to items and apply styles based on those IDs and classes. The difference between an ID and a class is that an ID is unique. That is, there's only one thing on the page that has a given ID. You know, your student ID number is unique. You're the only person that has that. Whereas if I talk about class, like what class are you in? Are you a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? That is not unique. There can be more people that have that class. So same idea here. So if I have that, all right, I can give an ID to just one of the cells in that column, remember, because if I size one of the cells in the column, it sizes them all. So I could say ID equals city. And then I can put a style rule in based on city. And if you're styling based on an ID, you start it with a pound sign. All right. So we just type in the tag. That's a tag name. Pound sign before it means an ID. So I can give this a width of let's say 40%. Now, if you notice this, we've again given it conflicting instructions. We've said that all THs are 25%, right? So we have four THs, that is 100%. But we said one of the columns is 40%. So three of our columns are going to be 25%, and one of them is going to be 40%. That makes up 115%, all right? What does it do? Again, it takes a shot and does what it can to follow your instructions as close as it can without cutting off any content, without violating the rules of physics and mathematics and all that. What I could do is, this might be better if I make the, the width of a TH 20%. Then, THs get 20%. Well, I have four of them. And you might say, well, that's only 80%. But one of them I've given a style of 40% to. So 40% for the one TH, 20% for the other three, that adds up to 100%. But again, at a certain point, it has to 
cut it off. Now, you might not want the THs to be centered and bold. All right? You might want to represent your THs a different way. Maybe with a different color or a different font or a different font size. Again, that's the default. You can overrule it. So how can we overrule it? We can go in and put TH color blue font size 1.2M, let's say. All right, then we have it look like this. We could even, even give a background if we wanted to. Give a background of the TH to yellow. Now, I'm going to make this bigger. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to use a different color, at least temporarily. I hope you can see, I think you can, there's a little gap between those. By default, a table has a little mini border around each cell. What if you don't want that? For example, I think that kind of looks dumb. I'd want it to be a solid bar going all the way across. You can accomplish that by putting the border collapse attribute on the table. And I can say border dash collapse colon collapse. Not making this up. And now notice that it gets rid of the gap between those. So in my mind, that makes for a cleaner looking table. But in some cases, you might want the grid line. All right? In which case, you might not do that. All right? Let's go and change it back to a more reasonable background color. Pound sign. Um, that I think looks pretty good. All right. What if we want to center the TDs? Well, assuming we want to center all the TDs, we would go TD text align center. All right, and now everything is centered within its proper column. Now, one thing that's useful, particularly with bigger columns, is to alternate the color, the background color of the table rows. All right. Let me just go and let me block, uh, copy this block of code and paste it in just to add a bunch of rows to the table. All right, when you have a bunch of rows in a table, the tendency is, or the possibility is, is for your eye to drift up or down a little bit. So if I'm looking at this number, all right, especially if you consider that that number could be way over here, I have a tendency to drift up or down. And I might not be able to read the column uh, or the row header very well because I might... I might drift up or down. 
So one thing that can be done is we can make the, the colors of the table rows alternate. All right? Now, there's an old-fashioned way of doing it, and then there's a newfangled modern CSS3 way of doing it. All right? Let's go over both of them because I think both of them are good. All right. Now, the old-fashioned way of doing it, what do you think that would be? I don't want to make every TR a certain color. I just want to make some of them a certain color. Right, give them the same class. Again, since there's more than one, I'm not going to use an ID here. I'm going to use a class. So the old-fashioned way would be to do this. I could define a class as alt. Alternating row. And I could define that class for every other column. Oh, I'm sorry, every other row. All right. Then I can define a style rule based on that class. So I could say dot class color green. I got a problem here. Yeah, I think I'm, I could be missing a bracket. But. Repeat that, please. Right. Right. Um, class, it should be dot all. And now you notice that the alternating colors are green. So that'll help your eye as you go across. You can do the same thing with the background or any other, any other thing. All right. What if we want to put a line between those things? How could we put a line underneath? That's the border property, right? So, I could say border one px solid black, and that would give me a box around it. Each alternating one. All right. What if I wanted that around every TD? I could go and put that, put it on every TD. And that gives me an actual table that looks like a table. It looks like an Excel worksheet. What if I didn't want the full grid, though, if I just wanted an underline underneath each table data? Border bottom. All right. So I could say border dash bottom. And there's a line underneath each of them. All right. Again, I, I've made the analogy before of CSS being like chess. You know, chess is really only a handful of rules, right? But just knowing the rules doesn't make you a good chess player. 
you have to really work on it and, and understand how to make the moves effective. Sort of the same thing with CSS. With CSS, um, there's certain rules. You can apply a style based on a class, a tag, um, a ID. You can mix and match those things. You can set attributes. But learning how to do it effectively and when to do this versus that to achieve what you want to get, that's the art of it. Now I mentioned there's a CSS3 solution for alternating rows and I don't remember what it is. So I will Google CSS3 You've got me. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, interesting. So we can say TR nth child even, make one background. But of course, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, because this is an old version of Internet Explorer. And if we were to view this in Chrome, I would guess that it would work. And there we go. So, tables, pretty simple, right? And we're going to fill in some of the holes that we have as, as far as accessibility goes and some advanced features. But tables, in a nutshell, four main tags. Table tag, TR tag, then you have THs and TDs. All right? Remember here, uh, more than maybe other any other one, the the your appearance is going to be based on the CSS that you put in plus the browser's default behavior. Also recognize for this that it's possible to give impossible instructions to the CSS. If I, made, if I said, for example, to make each column 50% of the table, well, it can't do that if there's four columns. It will try. It will do the best that it can uh, in executing your commands, but if it can't do it, it figures out a way that's most reasonable from the browser's perspective to do it. We can put styling in and we can use anything that we've learned so far as far as style goes. All right, Background colors, borders, things of that nature to enhance the appearance and more importantly than that, to enhance the, to enhance the usability of the table. Um, I don't like that being blue. I made it blue deliberately. Let's go and change that back to black. And let's make this All right. That not only looks good from an aesthetic viewpoint, it's also useful in, again, especially if the, count, if the rows of data were long, in seeing that, yeah, that relates to Cleveland and not Los Angeles or Boston, because both the border and the color bar of that um, guides the eye to this. All right. We'll wrap up tables on Monday and start JavaScript. All right, any questions? We'll see you up in lab.